It's the week ending Saturday the 28th of April and this is the week unwrapped. In the past seven days we've seen an unprecedented meeting of Korean leaders both north and south, a van driver in Toronto killing 10 people and Meghan Markle making her final appearance in the TV show Suits just weeks before her marriage to Prince Harry. But we're here to bring you some of the stories that passed under the radar this week. Big news not making headlines right now, but with repercussions for all our lives. I'm Ollie Mann. Let's unwrap the week. And joining me from the week's digital team are Holden Frith, Holly Clements and Cameron Tate. And Cameron, you're starting the show this week. What do you think this week should be remembered for? Well, it turns out the future isn't as bright as the old orange adverts said it would be. And a quick warning, this clip contains strong language. You shouldn't mess around with my stuff. It makes me nervous. I'm sorry, Todd. What are you looking at? Maybe you think this is easy. Maybe you think it's my fault your fucking mother took off. Fucking whore walked out on me for a fucking account. That was a trailer from the forthcoming video game Detroit Become Human, developed by Quantic Dream for PlayStation. Cameron, there's been a trend towards narrative-led gaming or interactive storytelling, whatever you want to call it, for a while now. What is different about this one? This is a game from a a developer called Quantic Dream. They are known for creating very story-driven games. Most of them are relatively gritty, but what makes this one different is it tackles the issue of domestic abuse. How? Well, it's set in the future, in a poor household of where it's a father and his daughter. Gamers play as the daughter, but it turns out that the father abuses his daughter. So gamers will actually see the daughter being physically hit. You, as the player, are given the option to actually kill her father. And you're playing as the daughter? You can, but you can also play as an android housemaid, and the two work together but it's at the end of the day it's your decision of whether you intervene or you can kill him okay so are you highlighting this because you think in sort of tabloid terms i guess this has gone too far or are you highlighting this because you think this is a new maturity and sophistication for video game design it's fantastic i think it's very important to address the issue of domestic abuse and i think computer games are a fantastic way of of actually interacting with with very serious issues um and i think this is really the first major issue that a computer game has come across. Obviously, we've got games like Grand Theft Auto. Um, where yeah, you have, I'd call that a pretty big issue. Yeah, <laughs> you know, a serial you killing spree in a yeah, car. It's, yeah. but, it's, but it's glorified. But this is a seems like a very grim and realistic portrayal of domestic abuse and may actually spawn a, a conversation about it. Okay, Holly, is it fantastic? I'm not sure if I'd use the word fantastic. It's something I feel uncomfortable about. I, I haven't seen it either, so I wouldn't want to judge how they deal with it. But even in television programs and films when you deal with something like domestic violence it needs to be handled in such a way that you can understand the victim I guess it's a bonus that you're playing the victim or an android rather than the father you're not just going around killing people as you might do in Grand Theft Auto but I would have a lot of questions to ask like how does it what's the context around it does it teach you anything does it prompt conversation or is it just kind of for the narrative sake part of it just to make you excited about going around shooting people and giving someone a a reason to do that rather than dealing with the actual aspect. Yeah, I mean, presumably one of the narrative options in response to seeing the father beat up the daughter is to become violent yourself and take out vengeance on him. Exactly, And, I mean, that isn't a particularly healthy lesson about domestic violence. It might be accurate. It might be what a lot of victims feel, but most victims don't do. We won't really know until the game comes out next month. So this is from pre-release previews that critics have got a hold of it. So we, we won't really know exactly what your decisions after that scene will, will manifest into. I've seen uh, some of the early previews from critics who've been saying that they've actually behaved in quite a different way once they've been immersed into the narrative of the game. One critic called um, Callie Plagg said she she ended up behaving much more violently in the situation than she'd expected. She sort of gone in expecting and hoping to be the sort of peacemaker trying to get the girl out of the situation without having to resort to violence, but ended up taking a much more violent solution. And I think that in itself is interesting and could be valuable, but does also highlight some of the the fears that, that Holly was talking about, that this could either highlight 
a very simplistic approach to domestic violence, or it could actually work against that and show that these these sorts of situations are very complex and that we may not respond in the way that we expect um, ourselves to, and that we might therefore think more carefully about how other people caught up in these sorts of situations do end up acting. I think when you so when you're playing a game especially in, in this sense of where it, it almost looks like, a, if you if you see the trailers, it almost looks like an interactive movie. Um, you basically get button prompts to choose which decision you, you want to make. And I think in some aspects that can immerse you into the story, but it can also detach you from the actual emotions of what's, what's going on in the scene. Well, also, you're not just playing to do the right thing, are you? I mean, one of the things about playing games is what would happen if I did this? And that's Holly's point, isn't it? It can be quite interesting to think what would happen if I bash someone over the head with a plank. Yeah. That's part of gaming. And the problem is the more that these visuals become more realistic and the more that these options are presented to gamers, they're not going to always choose the right thing because it's escapism. It doesn't make them a bad person if they're interested to see what happens if they choose to do the wrong thing. Mm. But it does pose a moral dilemma. But I think it depends on the way that it's presented. So if you've got something like Grand Theft Auto, I mean, that really does glorify violence because you'd run someone over and they, they, they might say something funny. In this sense, I think if you make it really realistic or you make it very grim, you could make a decision and kind of go, oh, I didn't actually want to see that. Almost I'm glad I've seen that, but it's actually changed my opinion of the way that I, I may play the game. A lot of these arguments rem- reminded me of some of the concerns that were raised about violent films or even violent books. And in fact, the chairman of the Culture and Media and Sport Committee, Conservative MP Damon Collins, said it was completely wrong for domestic violence to be part of a video game at all. That kind of reminded me of the judge in the Lady Chatley trial saying that <laughs> adultery wasn't a fit subject for novels. But I think where where there is that difference is that it's the interactivity and that sense that you the game invites you to respond, almost trains you to respond. It could actually be desensitizing you or even familiarizing you with certain violent responses. You know, the US military have have long used video games as a way of, of training soldiers. And in fact they found that people in the Vietnam War conscripts were initially shooting over the heads of the enemy rather than at them and they used a sort of primitive form of a video game then and found that very effective at getting people used to that instinctive response to seeing an enemy combatant and firing at them rather than over them. We had the same thing with Call of Duty and basically people used to they used to try and spread ISIS propaganda through Call of Duty games because kids it was a, it's a competitive field it's basically competitive violence but I do think that is different to the, what we have here. I would say that the caveat that I I have is that it's actually an 18 rated game. Ah, that means nothing. <laughs> well, no, that means absolutely nothing, doesn't it? I mean, that is a crucial thing that's different perhaps with video games, even to 18 rated films, isn't it? Is that, you know, yeah, a lot of adults play video games, don't yeah. get me wrong, well aware of that, but kids do play video games and but, parents tend to ignore ratings. So yeah. you will have 12 year olds playing this game just as you have 12 year olds on Facebook, that is a fact. And I may come to eat these words, but I would, I'm, I would almost... I think it'd be better if younger people did play it, if they could relate to the girl and if they are in themselves in a, an abusive situation, it might help them identify that there's maybe problems that they have at home. Do you? <laughs> do you think it's like an educational game? It's not purely for entertainment? I do, I don't, well, no, I think it's... Yes, I think it's for entertainment, but I think it could help Does, people identify with problems. I can't imagine gamers coming away from a game thinking, hmm, I think differently about domestic violence now. I won't do that. Or I should have more sympathy for victims. I feel like mm. it would But you might say that a, a teenage boy watching a storyline on EastEnders might feel like that if That's there was why a I think that domestic violence storyline. That should also dealt with in an appropriate way, far from kind of wanting to censor everyone. But there's way, like Broadchurch, for example, in dealing with murder and rape. They've done it in a way that you really feel for the victims and it does change your view because you get a really kind of a big insight into what it might be like. But a video game could do that. But does it? I'm just not sure I believe it until I see it that yeah. it's not just gamers having fun shooting someone and they've been given a good motivation for it because they've seen him attack a little girl. I think another difference is if that if it is a if it's a storyline on on EastEnders or it's a film, that's sort of public and out in the open and there can be a general conversation about it. Whereas when it's in a a video game, particularly this sort of game where there's a sort of forking of narratives and you can take certain choices and you'll go off in different directions. Involved. You're more involved and also you you're not part of a collective community experiencing this at the same time. And also Parents, if you're talking about children in particular, parents might not be aware of what their child has experienced, is experiencing. It's much harder to have a conversation about that. It almost worried me more, Cameron, when you 
suggest that children in this situation might find it because I wonder whether that would be more helpful or more traumatizing in particular one of the options is that the child can shoot their way out of the problem with a gun that mm. doesn't feel like a, a healthy lesson yeah. yeah or being in a playground when other people have played that game or you're in that situation I can't see how it would help you I'm just not sure video games is the way forward for helping victims. I mean, victims. basically, if video games get to a real, mature, sophisticated age of being able to deal with society's big problems in the way that films do, we'd think nothing yeah. of a film that was about the Columbine Massacre or whatever. Mm. But I think most people would say if you played the shooter going into a school, that would be problematic in a video game. Yeah. But if we get to the stage where they're mature and, and can deal with those kinds of subjects, nothing should be off limits. You should be able to play a Nazi putting people into a gas chamber. And yet, clearly, because you're role-playing, there is a distinction. Yeah, I guess, yes. In my, in my opinion, from what I've seen, Detroit Become Human is the first game that brings this up in a manner that is, in an adult way, seriously trying to address an issue and it is in, in the style that you would see, say, a TV show or a, or a movie. And I do agree that these sorts of complex moral questions shouldn't be off limits for games. And clearly there will be missteps if, if people are experimenting. So I'm, I'm certainly not saying that they shouldn't have done this, more just that I hope they have been as careful and have considered all of the issues that we've been talking about as they've been making what may be a, a real step forward in this sort of genre. I mean, I don't know about you, but I learned a lot about the potency of magic mushrooms from Mario. So <laughs> there are lessons. Boy, um, has gaming come along. <laughs> there are always lessons. Uh, Holly, you're up next this week. What do you think this week will be remembered for? It's time ticking down for one of our favourite household objects. Are you horrified at the, the thought that, that, that this could be the end of the an analogue clock? You know what? I am. And not because I love clocks or anything like that. I mean, you wouldn't, you'd wouldn't. do well to tell the time on the countdown clock because it's got one arm and it only goes up to 30 seconds. But it's just basic maths, isn't it? I mean, kids, are, they're taught to read clock as a skill from the age of about five and six from the national curriculum of, of math. So to think that age 14, 15, 16, kids can't use clocks. I mean, fair enough if you want to give them an advantage in exam great but i think the bigger issue is the numeracy levels rachel riley from the tv game show countdown speaking on five live this week holly what happened this week well there's a teacher at a conference in london who told participants that they had a lot of children in year 10 11 and sixth form who don't know how to tell the time and they've started using digital clocks in exams to make things easier so don't know how to read an analog clock analog clock yes now that's on the primary school curriculum isn't it it is although so you why might say don't they know 10 years later if you've not <laughs> been around an analog clock if you don't have one at home and you use your mobile phone to tell the time I see. or digital watch you might just have not come across an analog clock and far be it from me to disagree with the hero that is Rachel Riley, <laughs> but I kind of see their point in a way that maybe it is time for a household object that doesn't really do its job very well. If you can tell the time quicker using a digital clock, why not use that object instead of an old historic object such as a clock? Holden, I feel like you should be coming to the defence of the analogue clock. I don't know why. I, can you root it in classicism for us I, or something? <laughs> I, can't, I can't do that. I do like analogue clocks and I do think it should continue to be on the syllabus. Not necessarily because everybody will continue to use one throughout the rest of their lives. But it's a good concept. It's a good exercise. I think it makes you think in a slightly different way. Just as we learn long division, even though I'm sure all of us around this table learned long division, I doubt many of us could demonstrate it at will. I can't will. even add up on paper. <laughs> but, <laughs> I can't even do the carry the one thing because I have a calculator. That's true. And we learned how to do sums with pounds, shillings and pence as well at school, which is never going to be useful in the future. Holden went to school in the 1950s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a completely balmy way of, of running a current but I think uh, it teaches your brain to think in a more agile way about numbers. It's a, it's a learning tool rather than a life skill. And I, I, think, I think some people will still actually always want to keep an analogue clock around. OK. An element of nostalgia by the sounds of it. But do you need a kind of maths test every time you need to do something functional like read the time? No, I agree that in exam rooms it makes sense to use a digital watch because it's not an exam in clock reading if you're you know it's an exam in english literature then fine just use the method of telling the time that most people are comfortable well with. actually i mean a countdown clock would be more useful mm. wouldn't it i remember thinking that when i used to do exams i mean why don't they just have a thing telling you how many minutes you've got left that's what you need to know isn't it yeah i remember somebody writing on the blackboards again blackboards probably dating me too but you know exam starts at 904 a.m finishes at 12.04 p.m 
you know, in a school clock, the difference between 1203, 1204, 1204, it's not all that necessary to, necessarily easy to read. So you can kind of hope that the teacher's going to slightly misread it, give you an extra minute or two here. Obviously, you, the analog clock. A, you don't know when the minute hand is between two points on the clock, how many seconds there actually are until it ticks on to the next bit. So it could be up to 30 seconds out, couldn't it? People across the country could be sitting exams and having 30 seconds less than other people sitting exams. From that point of view, digital clocks make sense as well. I know, it's absolutely mad, isn't it? Thinking you could get an extra 30 seconds in an exam. Sometimes you have an analog clock. That extra 30 seconds. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, sometimes. But. Cameron, you're a future gazing kind of guy. Do you oh, think yeah. this is a necessary evolution that Holly is proposing to burn all the analog clocks in the street? I'm always a future gazer, but I'm a bit of an enigma too because I love wearing a, an analog watch. You know, you're um, pointing at your silver, very nice silver wristband at the moment. Is there some digital technology going on in there? Nothing. No. Oh, okay. And I, I did have a, a digital watch. I had a, I was trialling a digital tag last year. I didn't really see the point of it, but I guess I am of that generation of where I've, I'd never really grew up with smart watches. So I, I much prefer having an analog watch on my wrist. I think it looks nicer. But I, I do agree. I don't think there's any. There's no point in my day where I have to look at something and go, uh, look at an analog clock and go, that's the time. Okay, so that's the clock issue. Okay, so we, broadly speaking, agreeing. I think primary school kids should learn it, but then they shouldn't have to be able to read one in their exams. But what about all the other things that are on the curriculum that might not be that relevant to children's lives as they go about them in 2018? This is true, and it sounds shocking, but there's been other instances that teachers are talking about about children, or as a paediatrician saying that children can't actually hold pens and pencils in the same way that we could, which obviously would be writing everything at school, and now people are using tablets, computers, and their actual muscles aren't functioning in the same way. Do I propose getting rid of all handwriting? <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to go that far today, but I guess if you look into 100 years' time, will handwriting exist? I mean, there's there's so many different things that children are taught to do, maybe nostalgically or because we've already always done it in a certain way. They might be the way of the future. These children that are saying they can't write, I'm defending all the children. If you can't read a clock, which is called horological illiteracy, <laughs> if you want to know the technical term that the Times Educational Supplement use. Of um, course we do. But is, is that the end of lots of things that we use in everyday life? Pens and pencils, a clock... I don't want to doom the future of all the things that we, we're I, used to. I think map reading is a, map a big reading, one yeah. that's on the way out as well. Now, yeah, particularly if you're driving, you'll just put a postcode into a sat-nav and it will lead you, you hope, to the right destination. I have been led astray a couple of times. <laughs> and it's really convenient and you wouldn't want to lose that. But it does mean that if you are then forced to look at a, a map and you know read the landscape, read roads, try and find your way, that is going to be a lost art very it's soon. It's important to remember as well that if you can read an analog clock, then you can read a sundial. So if you're stranded <laughs> and you don't have an analog watch to double as a compass... And you stumble across a sundial. And you stumble across a sundial, you're in the then, Queen's Garden. But you know what I was also thinking as well? What about the spelling test? Because if you're all using tablets mm. or laptops, mm. it's just going to spell check everything for you. But spell check doesn't work. I have a news editor here. <laughs> <laughs> spell check doesn't tell you if the word is the correct word or not. You mm. might get your were and your where's wrong. It might give you the American <laughs> English spelling. Mm. You might, exactly. There'd be Z's all over the place. Do you think that it would be reasonable to cut those things from the classroom, though? Because you're saying in 100 years, maybe they'll be gone. But what about in 20 years? You know, if, if you had kids that were at school 10, 20 years' time, well, this isn't a hypothetical, is it? You do. How would you feel if you knew, right, they're not going to be learning long division, they're not going to be learning how to read an analogue watch, and they're not going to be learning how to spell certain words? I don't think it's time to get rid of those things yet. I just think we should be slightly more empathetic with those children that struggle to read a clock because they haven't been around a clock rather than immediately calling them thick which some of the tabloid newspapers have this week thick talk was the headline <laughs> thick in the sun. Talk. <laughs> what did you make of that it just seems a little bit unfair it's a reasonable pun i thought holden what do you think is going to be the big story of the week i've been learning how our gut instincts may be leading us astray the microbiome is full of mystery it's the strange and alien world of our non-human selves. The trillions of microbes on and in all of us constitute a second genome, yet have been largely ignored for decades. But now, their secret is out. Science is piecing together how vital they are for our physical health. But their work has uncovered something controversial. A new idea is emerging that claims gut bacteria are an invisible hand altering our brains. 
BBC science and health correspondent James Gallagher talking this week on the Radio 4 documentary Gateway to the Mind. You can find that on the BBC's iPlayer radio app. Holden, bacteria can change your mood. That's the revelation. So what? Well, I think this is a really big question that has both practical and moral implications. So the practical implications are that there may be a new way of treating depression, even of preventing degenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's. But then there's also the broader question of really as as deep as free will and how we are, how our behavior, how even our feelings and emotions can be determined by these tiny players that are working away within our bodies without us even really thinking about them. Okay, well, thanks for ramping up the drama for us. Um, (laughs) Can you give us the science? What's this story that your, your gut feeling could be your gut bacteria's feeling? Essentially, yes. So this goes back a few years now to researchers in Japan who discovered that sterile mice they were using in the lab. So these are mice that have no bacteria, any other kind of microbes within them used for research purposes. They produce twice the amount of stress hormones as otherwise identical mice that had a normal level of gut bacteria. This set off a whole series of studies, mostly in mice and rats, but increasingly in humans too. And this has managed to support the idea that the levels of different bacteria we have in our stomach have quite a profound effect, particularly on the levels of stress we feel, but even possibly, and this is still controversial, but possibly even on um, conditions such as clinical depression. Okay, Holly, so do you like the idea that uh, if you or someone in your family, loved one, went to the doctor, diagnosed with depression, the answer might be microbe treatments? I find this so fascinating. Apparently, if you count all the cells in your body, only 43% are human, which has made me question myself all week whether I'm actually human or just a giant germ. What are are the others? It's microscopic colonists, so things like fungi, viruses, bacteria, weird things that you wouldn't expect your body to be made up of are not human cells, which, horrifying. I mean, I'm not a scientist, but this is, it's a really interesting subject. Four pounds worth of your body, which I'm knocking off my weekly <laughs> weigh in, isn't me, it's bacteria. <laughs> but um, going back to the depression thing, I think there's still a question about whether the cause and effect, whether if you are prone to depression in your brain, your brain signals to your stomach to kind of create the right area for bacteria to grow in or whether that bacteria is going back to your brain to cause the depression so it sounds like they're still doing studies to work yeah, out which way around it it works a lot of work going on there there are some studies which support a causal link so one of the more bizarre experiments i've read about the scientists took stool samples from people suffering from depression and transplanted <laughs> i don't know why i find that funny <laughs> it just <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, carry on. Scientists took stool samples from people who were suffering from depression and transplanted them into normal, healthy rats. That produced symptoms in the rats, which the scientists said were consistent with them feeling similar levels of depression. So they became listless, they lost their appetite. Nothing had changed except their gut bacteria. Going in the other direction, the results have been slightly less consistent. Some bacteria that have reduced stress levels in either mice or rats have led to a similar effect in humans, both measured um, chemically in terms of levels of cortisone and also sort of self-reported feeling of well-being, whereas other strands of bacteria that have worked in rats don't seem to have had any effect at all. So okay, clearly there how is still do they get a self-reported feeling of well-being from a rat? That's the thing, isn't it? So they I can know, only was, do that with humans. This was amongst the humans. Yeah, so yeah, we don't, how do we know there's a correlation between what they can find in they, rodents they and they humans? Sugar test, didn't they? They, and some mice really enjoyed sugary water, and then when they got these feelings of depression, they didn't enjoy it anymore. Cameron, the science on this may be sound, but people are going to get shilled a lot of crap on the back of this, aren't Mm. they? Commercialism, consumerism is going to come in and say, right, here's the product to resolve your mental health issue. And it might just be a placebo. Yeah, I think I I really do think it will be a, a placebo effect for the moment if they jump on the bandwagon now, because I still think the research is relatively is in its early stages, particularly as we we pointed out earlier that the mice that were sterile were producing double the amount of stress hormones in their brain so I think even if you're changing your if you are taking different bacteria you're changing the balance in your body your brain's just going to react to it 
anyway. One of the difficulties with doing this sort of research is that there are so many different interlocking factors and it's not even always clear which bacteria are having which effect and trying to isolate that from related effects such as diet, exercise, exposure to sunlight, sort of your general state of health is really, really difficult. And the placebo effect in any kind of psychological situation is is particularly hard to isolate. So I think even the scientists who are who have completed what look like the most promising research are really positing this as something we should be thinking about more rather than, as you suggest, Ollie, a reason that, you know, we should go and eat more probiotic yogurts. It's such an appealing idea, though, isn't it, Holly? That's the thing. People, especially scanning blogs and Instagram and Pinterest and whatever and just picking up the gist of this, will think, ah, well, this makes sense because... If I go for a job interview and I feel nervous, I feel it in my stomach. So there's a connection a between yogurt. brain and stomach. <laughs> Have a yogurt, yeah. It does make sense. But I think even the experts at the forefront, like Holden says, are saying it probably isn't going to replace antidepressants, for example, yet at least. I think there's still many other things that will go towards it. Talking therapies, antidepressants come first. And then maybe there'll be a selection of probiotics that your doctor might recommend as well. Well, I'm going off to buy some probiotic yoghurt anyway. Uh, That is it from this edition of The Week Unwrapped. My thanks to Holden Frith, Holly Clements and Cameron Tate. If you like the show, then please take a moment to rate and review and subscribe to us on your podcast app of choice. It really helps us get more listeners and bring our show to ever-increasing devotees. And for more from us at The Week, why not visit theweek.co.uk, where you can also sign up to our free email newsletter, The Week Day. Uh, Or, of course, you can have the magazine delivered direct to your door. Just head to theweek.co.uk slash subscribe. I've been Ollie Mann. Our music is by Tom Morby. And the producer is Matt Hill at Rethink Audio. Until we meet again to unwrap next week, bye-bye.